Greetings to you all in the room um, and to members of the media joining us online via our live stream. My name is Trevor Cheu. I'm with the World Economic Forum. Welcome to this pivotal press conference on redesigning health with women in mind. If you are um, engaging with us online, please use the hashtag WEF24. Stressing how pivotal this moment is, new data from our report being released this week shows that the women's health gap equates to 75 million lives lost due to poor health or early death per year. Also, did you know that if we close the women's health gap, we could boost the global economy by one trillion per annum? While you percolate on that, let me introduce you to my esteemed panel. On my left, I'm joined by Paula Beyosta Muetha. Next to her is Dan Vadat, CEO and founder of Huma. We have Sahil Tesfu, Chief Strategy Officer from SET, and Per Falk, President of Fairing Pharmaceuticals. Allow me to paint um, a picture for you on the wide gap seen in women's health. According to the research in our um, Closing the Women's uh, Health Gap report, we see women's health not being prioritized. The reasons are clinical trials are mostly done without women in mind. There is lack of investment in understanding a woman's body, meaning with women, there are often delays in diagnosis. Data collected related to women's disease burden excludes or undervalues important conditions. With all of this in mind, Kenny has initiated an open letter to turn the tide on the fundamental problem in preserving women's lives and to close the women's health gap. Having stressed on the very wide women's health gap that ultimately affects all of us and all of society, it is very much encouraging um, to see momentum around closing the gap and the importance being placed on the intersection between women and medicine. Paula, she is from Kenny. Let me start with you. Why the open letter and why thank, now? Thank you, Trevor, and uh, thank you for having me as part of this uh, esteemed panel. It is a sad reality that a really significant gap exists between both the experience and the outcomes of men and women going through the healthcare system. And it is a reality that is just not a north uh, reality or south or east or west or developing or developed. It is a global problem and is one that urgently and deliberately needs to be addressed. And Trevor started to allude to some of the underlying reasons why. And we see three themes. The first one starts with biology. We do not understand female biology as well as we do that of men. And that is not only on what traditionally has been understood as women health, so reproductive health systems, in, for example, endometriosis, which is a disease that affects 10% of women of reproductive age, yet it doesn't see the level of investment or interest in finding a diagnostic or finding a cure. But it doesn't stop there. And I think what we need to do is redefine what is women's health, because if we start to think about other diseases uh, that are predominantly female, like ne neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's, migraine, or other diseases like those of um, autoimmune uh, system, we're not understanding how those manifest in women, and we don't understand, therefore, how can we find cures and therapies that are specific for them. And then if I come to the last part, which is diseases that traditionally have been associated with men, like, for example, cardiac disease, they actually manifest differently in women. So we are not diagnosing women, and we're not treating them, and we're seeing a lot of lives lost. So the biology and the understanding is really important. This links me to my second point, that is an economic argument. We're not understanding it, the biology, because we're not investing in it. And it's not just about the investment in research and development of these conditions. It's also the investment, for example, in technology, where we see digital health being a real area for investment from the private equity community, the VC community, but only 3% of that investment is going into what we know as femtech. So there is also an issue there. 
But it's a significant opportunity, like Trevor was outlining. It's a trillion dollars that is sitting there as a potential that has to be unlocked. And I think at the heart of it is a societal problem because we are not prioritizing the lives of women in the same way that we do those of men. And this then leads to, we're not investing in it, but we also, when a woman enters the healthcare system, she is more likely to have her, her concerns dismissed, ignored, or potentially missed altogether. And that's why we see the diseases that are common for men and women, women tend to get diagnosed four years later than a man. So we are painting a bleak picture, but we are hopeful because we know what has to be done. We need to work on policy and advocacy. We need to redesign infrastructure for women's sector care. We need to make sure the capital is flowing into this. We need to rethink research and development, both in what we research, but also in how we research it. We need to close the data gap. And then finally, we need to reimagine medical education because we're still using reference man as the basis for our medical schools. How about reference woman? Um, so we wrote a report on all of this, but reports are only so good because those people that read them are those that are in our eco chamber that want to um, drive the change. So what we need is mobilization. We need creativity, we need collaboration, and we need community. And that's why the open letter was created, so that we could get many organizations from within the healthcare system and the ecosystem and beyond, because we need the whole of society behind this. And we're really excited about the fact that 53 organizations, and it's growing every day, have come together to form this village. Um, for many of you that are listening, you probably have got children and know the saying of it takes a village to raise a child. Um, this is a much more complex problem, and it is really going to require this entire village. Um, much more complex unless you have a two-year-old, because the terrible twos are pretty significantly challenging. Um, but we need this village, and uh, this is the beginnings of it, and we are really excited about what we can achieve, because there is uh, such an urgency to get going. We don't want to see 131 years until we close this gap. We want it to start happening now, and to be sitting with all of you next year, telling you that we made significant progress. Progress. Hey, let me turn it over to you. Um, the Women's Health Alliance that Fearing Pharmaceutical is, uh, Pharmaceuticals is part of was crucial in publishing um, the Closing the Women's Health uh, Gap Report. What are the main areas of action um, that we could um, look at from an economic impact in addressing gender inequality um, for health? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so first of all, the report uh, basically confirms, uh, maybe with greater authority and more updated data, what I think everybody already knows. Uh, the closer you are to healthcare, you would be more familiar with it. Uh, there is a systemic challenge, right? And, and Paulina has, uh, has referred to that. There's, there's a systemic challenge where we basically neglect human, uh, female diseases or female symptoms of diseases that we're all affected of, which means that they get misinterpreted, they present themselves in different ways, and for many years, I'm a doctor, uh, you know, there has been this notion about uh, the, the, the aching, itching uh, syndrome that women present themselves with, that it, it's hard, it hurts somewhere, and as a doctor, you don't know what to do, so you refer it to, to some, uh, it's a psychosomatic, right? Now we know that's not the case. It is biology. You know, uh, myocardial infarction in a woman looks different. That means that the doctor needs to be aware of that and recognize those symptoms, because if you look for the classic symptoms of a male myocardial infarction, which I think many of you in the room already know, because we're taught, look for this, right? But in a woman, it looks different. I'm pretty sure that none of you are fully aware of what that looks like. And that is biology. And to Bolina's point, you know, those structural problems need to be overcome. There is a risk with this report, even though there is an opportunity as well, that it presents such daunting numbers. It's like climate change. In the end, it becomes so big, so complex, so multifaceted, that people just lose heart and energy and says, well, how are we going to address this? Uh, and I know Sahil is probably going to say something similar, but you know, in my world, if you have a, a big audacious challenge, you turn that into a big audacious goal that you want to choose to solve. But then you solve that problem by approaching it in small, small steps every day. So, of course, there is the opportunity when biology and research catches up, 
but that's going to take a long time. But it can be done, because it's been done before. Look at oncology and cancer, which 50 years ago, nobody knew what to do about at all, right? And today, it's the most studied and, should we say, most sophisticated pharmaceutical market in the world. You can do this. It just takes time. Uh, you can find the biology for why more Alzheimer or, or uh, MS affects women but it will take time, and maybe you need different therapies, and therapy development is, it will take time. But there is a here and today, the small steps that while we invest and do this, and in the end, frankly, overcome the bias that the world has since most decision makers and policy shapers are men. And Paulina has also said that, and we should, of course, sort that out as well, but if you start there, we will never go anywhere. So today, there are things that you can do and should do to address uh, medical problems that doesn't need new innovation. It needs access, and it needs a system for allowing women worldwide to have access to them, like, like how, how we are addressing maternal mortality rates, like Faring working with the WHO, uh, with the UNFPA, uh, with MSD for Mothers and others, to distribute uh, uh, uterotonics that are heat resistant to low and low middle income countries. That's just a matter of doing it now because the innovation is there, the need is there, now you just need to, to fix it. And there are many, many of those that we can do while we actually reshape healthcare by also reshaping our views on male and female uh, health and disease. Hmm? So Hill, let me come to you. The interesting concept of the open letter is that it incorporates um, organizations that are really, really deep into um, the healthcare ecosystem. What can these types of organizations, such as yours, really um, bring to the table in closing the gap? Mm -hmm. So let me start by saying that I think uh, we should take, uh, as consumer healthcare companies in this space, a rights-based approach to the issue. Uh, so we can see more clearly that there is a real need uh, to act, yeah, and we don't debate whether we have to do something or don't have to do something. So I think a right, rights-based approach uh, will help the conversation. So then, of course, as a, as a global uh, company here, we have a platform uh, that we can use. We have a platform towards our consumers, our customers, our investors, policymakers, and we can raise awareness for the topic. It's as simple as that, to start talking uh, about the issue and to make it a priority on the different uh, meeting agendas uh, that are out there. So that's the first thing we can do. In our case, very specifically for SET, that means uh, raising awareness on the menstrual health gap. Uh, as an example, uh, 1.8 billion people menstruate every month across the globe, yet we also know that most of them actually cannot do so in a dignified way because they don't have access to products, they don't have access to sanitation facilities that are clean and hygienic, they don't have access to education uh, information, and thus they cannot fully participate in life, private life, school life, work life, and thus they cannot fully unfold their potential. And that connects back to this report, which then of course could lead uh, to huge implications if we could solve something as, I don't want to say as simple, but as, you know, everyday reality, uh, like menstruation. Uh, so that is something you know where we can come very concrete. And I also want to say to your po uh, to your point earlier, uh, again, menstrual health gap is not uh, a problem of the so-called developing uh, world. There is no north, south, no east, west uh, in this issue. It's omnipresent. Okay, it's a global issue. So we can all work on this also together. And secondly, then I think also we can uh, we can use the power of the brands. Uh, that we have in the space, because sometimes as uh, corporations or organizations, we struggle a little bit, you know, to be edgy and to, uh, you know, drive uh, controversial societal discourse, but we have brands out there that can do this for us. Uh, ST in 2017, we were the first period care brand in the world that showed blood in a period commercial on TV. 2017. Last time I counted, that's not too long ago. Uh, until then, it was blue liquid. Okay, and by doing these kind of, uh, let's say, a more provocative and also edgy things through our brands, again, we can drive systemical uh, change. And yes, it took also changing of media and marketing laws out there to do so, uh, but we managed. We started small in a couple of countries, and now it has become uh, the norm to do so. Uh, then also we can invest and dedicate resources. Uh, also back to Pear's point, first of all, let's become specific of what is the problem that we're trying to solve. And I think there we need to divide and conquer uh, a little bit. Um, 
and I will come to the point of collaboration and coalition in a second, but everyone also has a responsibility here to act uh, on their own. And once we have identified where we want to do that, then we need to be very serious in terms of the resources that we dedicate to that uh, and the investments uh, that we put into research, but also in innovation. And I think every company would argue that they take a consumer-centric approach to research and development and innovation. But if we really mean it, then we also need to cons understand the consumer in all their diversity, in this particular case, women in all their diversity, to be impactful. Then the coalitions and the collaborations, I also want to say that I think it's super important to collaborate very broadly on this topic because uh, even if you take just a simple, not simple, but very specific problem like menstrual health, uh, you already see it's a very multifaceted issue that touches very different uh, faces of life and also society. So we need collaboration across the private uh, and the public sector, but I think we need to also uh, think a little bit outside of the box what that collaborations could look like uh, because what brought us here is not going to get us where we need to go, so there might be also a couple of unusual suspects uh, that you need to collaborate with also outside of your usual comfort zone. And then the last point I'm going to make is on diversity, equity, and inclusion. As organizations, as corporate corporations out there in the world, we also need to understand that there is a huge interdependence here and also uh, knock-on effects of our ability to also really live a diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda internally in our organizations. If we don't have the representation and uh, you know uh, our own house in order, so to say, it will be very difficult to move the needle. And I think gender equality is a very much underestimated accelerator. It can be a speedboat uh, for a lot of these issues that we're discussing here today, but we also need to clean house internally first. So you touched on a very important aspect around collaboration, and I'll come to it um, just now. But perhaps let me turn it over to Dan. Um, obviously, we're seeing very big corporates coming on board onto this um, open letter community. But what do you think um, would be a role of a small, innovative company um, coming on board to, to, to join the movement? I think at the end of the day, big problems like this, it's not a one company or few companies coming together. It requires all the players, from governments to small companies, from big companies to NGOs. Simply because the problem we are talking, it's more than half of the world. And there is this saying that they say, you know, healthy brain is in a healthy body. I want to expand that into a healthy family is built around healthy mothers. And that means even the impact of it is more than half of the, the population. So from that perspective, then we need everybody. And we need the peoples on the top to make this their number one agenda. Because everyone has priorities. And uh, sometimes really important topics, they don't fall into that top 10 priority of the top leaders. And my hope is some of the smaller companies, fast-growing companies like Huma, uh, which they do have lots of media exposures and impact because we are working with lots of, you know, we've, we, we have partnered with 15 of the top 20 pharma in the world, right? I can be that message ambassador. I can take that message to the CEO of these pharma if needed to be to ensure that not only their teams are working on it, but also this becomes the number one priority for them from the perspective of being just an ambassador. And then from another perspective, uh, the reason I started, for instance, Huma, was how can we democratize access to health through technologies that it doesn't make a differentiation between men or women, poor or rich person, and this is uh, the word of technology that we are talking, and by enabling individuals to be more empowered, not being too dependent to other people, other things that may have some biases, suddenly we are flipping the problems and coming up with the solutions in a very decentralized way. And the beauty of technology from our perspective is it's scalable, it is uh, relatively cost effective. Uh, even if it's not perfect, you can make an update and improve it really, really quick, as opposed to drugs that if you suddenly realize this drug is not fit for a specific patient's cohort or group cohort, it may take another 10 years or 20 years until you can really reverse basically the challenge and the problem. So from that perspective, I think 
uh, companies, especially technology companies, can, can drive the impact. But I really want to emphasize, and we have this session as well yesterday with a group of amazing people, this aim has to become number one agenda, I think, for WEF, for every big company in the world, their executive teams and their leaders, every head of state, uh, and hopefully next year when we do the press release, here you have the presidents and the CEO of the biggest and the most impo important groups, and lots of amazing people will hear them uh, to drive this mission forward, because as I said, this is the single most important topic. Thanks. Um, so here at the World Economic Forum, we believe, strongly believe in um, public-private co uh, collaboration to move the needle um, on challenges such as this one. Um, perhaps, um, Paula and Pe, um, if you could give us some thoughts on what you would expect from government. It's, it's really a pity that um, the minister couldn't join us um, for this press conference, but perhaps maybe you can share some thoughts on how you, you would want to expect an enabling environment um, that a government um, could offer um, to shift the needle. Yeah, so it's it's unfortunate, but the minister is on the on the board of the alliance, so so she is uh, fully committed to this. <laughs> and uh, you know, it's it's what gets asked for gets done. It's very simple. Public-private partnership in this case requires some specifics because it's a long way to go. But in reality, the private sector, to to Sahel's point are solution providers, and they should be solution providers. We should not be policy makers, uh, and we should not set the agenda for society. We should adapt to the needs of society and fill the needs with the tools that are required. Right? And that's how the entire foundation of the private sector and actually capitalism is based. There's a need, someone fills that need better than others, cheaper than others, or, and you get a space so you can sustain yourself. And where there is no need expressed, there is no innovation. You know, because even private sectors, we need to sustain our organization. We need to get paid, and no one gives us money. We make money, we pay taxes and salaries, and with what's left, we choose to reinvest in innovation, or we can give some away to philanthropy. And as long as we farm out a large part of female health, the most urgent female health, to philanthropy, like, I mean, admirable, uh, fantastic uh, players like the Gates or the big foundations uh, and, and advocates of various sorts, and people willing to contribute, even uh, Faring, which is not a big company, that's fine. You know, there's enough money to go around, so you can do it that way, but you will not get the competition and innovation that is required to improve that healthcare and over time make it cheaper because there are many people trying to improve upon each other's innovations. And that's why the public-private partnership is so important because the, the, the public will express the need. They will create the need for the private sector to meet because it takes a long time to develop a product, and when you do that, you want to know that if it works, sometimes it always works, I'm not saying what you do is easy, but, but it, uh, for me, it rarely works. So when I do that, I want to know that if it works, there is someone out there that says, good, we really need this, we've been waiting for this, thank you, and, and now we can actually have an exchange, right? So the definition of the policy, the statement, that this is a problem important enough to solve is basically the starting point and has been the starting point for every successful journey of improving elements of health care uh, through the last 50 years. Right? Sorry, can I just quickly add something to this? Because I think also in light of uh, now being here at the, at the World Economic Forum, I think issues like the women's health, uh, the gender equality, uh, just, uh, typically how they're approached is like, it's the right thing to do and it's the smart thing to do, right? And there's business cases pretty much for every societal uh, problem that we have. And I think there's also a lot of agreement that it's the right thing to do. But if we're missing this element is also what needs to be done. It's going to be very difficult, you know, to accelerate these things. And I think we need to a little bit get out of this, you know, uh, of this conversation between it's the right and it's the smart thing. That's also needed. But if we miss that one other element, I think it will be very difficult, as we have seen with other societal problems, to move the needle. And if I may add, uh, 2024 is a very special year. 
and I'm really glad that this initiative started, you know, to get to a more solid place this year, simply because this year we have the most number of elections happening. Politicians that can ultimately bring big impact by putting certain regulations, certain supports and initiatives, whatever it needs to be done. And I hope for the next three to six months, we can really maximize to educate these politicians so they put into their policies and their plans going forward. Because when they, before they get elected, they, ha they usually often commit to things. And then they're accountable to some extent, hopefully, deliver those things. After election, it's harder to get their attentions. So I hope this platform really accelerate that kind of education as well. Paula, succinctly. Very Your succinctly, thoughts. closing us out. I think we need to stop seeing it as a problem and it's more of an opportunity. If we have a healthy 52% of the population, we're going to have a much better chance at solving the climate crisis. We're going to have a much better opportunity at making sure that we transition uh, our economies in our world to be AI-enabled. So let's stop seeing it as a problem that we need to solve and let's think about the opportunity that having 52% of the population being treated equitably in the healthcare system with good outcomes. What can that unlock uh, for all of us. Um, and just some closing thoughts. Um, I think everybody, you've heard it from everyone, that it's time for specificity and it's time for action. So I'm really encouraged that we have a framework that we can go off and, and employ now. We have metrics that we can apply and we have this growing community now where we're going to be able to share what everybody's doing because everybody has a responsibility. We're going to have an, a, a space for experimentation together to Sahil's point and we're also going to be able to create just those non-traditional partnerships that probably will move us further and faster than we would have done if everybody had been working on their own. Well, I would like to thank you, my panelists, um, for coming on stage to really share this pivotal moment um, in the industry, really closing, trying to close the gap um, on women's health. And to our audience um, here in the room and online, thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you.